the enemy, the greater the chance of killing him. And remember, we shoot to kill with a minimum expenditure of ammunition. Off we go then, to show you a practical demonstration of when to fire with the Bren and rifle in defense against enemy ground troops. Here's a piece of country for which a section in defense is responsible. There's a good field of view, except for the background, which is rather fully wooded and obviously would give concealment to the enemy. But the foreground and middle distance are quite open and give a very good field of fire. Here is our section. Can you see it? Not on your life, so let's lay it bare. Here it is, in all its nudity, with no effort at concealment. Otherwise, we should have difficulty in spotting them at all. Everything seems to be in perfect order. The Bren gun has been posted on the right of the trench with a very effective arc of fire. And in the center is the corporal with his range card. Let's have a look at it, corporal. There's that wood at 800 yards, a yellow bush at 500 yards, and some gorse at 250 yards. Right. Now let's take a look at it all on the ground. On your left, the gorse at 250 yards, bush 500 yards, and the wood 800 yards. So far, so good. And now, back in the position again. The sentry on the left of the trench scans that piece of country we've just seen for any possible movement by the enemy. He knows the ranges on that card, or he should do, and we shall soon see how he deals with the situation should one arise. Hello, he seems to have seen something. Is that the enemy moving about there? Stap my vitals, it is the enemy. Now then, what are our chaps going to do about it? The range, remember, is 800 yards to that wood. Hey, stop! What's all this going on? Oh, Lord, that's torn it. They've given the whole show away. There goes the Bosch running back to tell the patrol where our position is. That's precisely what they were sent out for. And now we're going to cop it for that folly, and cop it hard. The enemy observer has a quick look at the ground, spots our position in spite of its cover, and... Precisely. That's what comes of not holding your fire until you're sure of a kill. Now for the same job as it should be done by men who know when to fire and who shoot to kill. This is another section in the same spot, gathering round the corporal who is explaining to them the reference points on the range card and then on the ground. 800 yards away, the wood ahead, Five hundred yards, the yellow bush, with an effective rifle range and very prominent indeed. And to the left of our position, the gorse at 250 yards. The section is alive and watchful, and the sentry on the alert for any possible movement by the enemy. Hear something? Is it Jerry moving about out there? Yes, by Jove it is. Stand to! Now that sentry knew his stuff. Spotting the Germans, he at once reported to his section leader, who has not given the fire order as yet. The Bosch don't know that they've been spotted, so they keep on getting nearer and nearer to getting killed. 500 yards to this yellow bush, and they will probably come closer still. The corporal, observing all changes of range, verifies them by reference to his range card. He's got a pretty shrewd idea that there are more to come out of that wood. And he's quite right. Here they come, well in view at 800 yards. But no firing as yet, not a shot from our lad. Moving up nicely, aren't they? 500 yards here, remember, but still they come on, quite oblivious to the presence of our position. Any more for the Skylark? Yes. Here comes some more of them. This was worth waiting for, and just shows you the value of holding your fire. Keen eyes watch their every movement as yet more of the enemy come on so innocently into the death trap which is being prepared for them in the open ground ahead. Gemeiner Steinmetz, vorwärts. Steinmetz sagte Ihnen vorwärts. Heil Hitler. Jawohl, Korporal. Heil Hitler. This fellow has been sent forward by the Jerry NCO to draw our fire and disclose the whereabouts of our men. Number three section, 400, yellow bush, 
I'm expecting enemy to come out from the bush. Open rapid. Await my order. Well done, Corporal. Get them all in that gap between the yellow bush at 500 and the gorse at 250 and they won't have a hope in hell. We're going to fire, Corp. Rapid, fire! Stop! Rifleman only, 250, right end of gorse. I've seen enemy in that area. Fire when you see a target. And there goes his snap shooting fire order. Those bursts from his brain gun scattered what was left of them, and now every man for his own target and in his own time. Nice work, Corporal. You shot to kill. Modern warfare has shown the importance of tanks in the scheme of things and the value of efficient and properly controlled defense against these sticky customers. Weapons are only as effective as the skill of the men who use them, but the anti-tank rifle in the hands of the man who knows when to fire can do immense damage to these battleships of the land. The sights on the anti-tank rifle can be adjusted to 500 and 300 yards. The .55 bullet which it fires will penetrate light Hun tanks like this British one up to 500 yards, provided the angle of impact is 30 degrees or less. Now, what exactly does this mean in plain English? Well, we'll get Company Sergeant Major Instructor Maber to give us the lowdown. Maber! Sir? Will you explain this angle of impact business? Certainly, sir. Now, let us assume that the tip of my stick actually represents the nose of the bullet and the remainder of my stick, the path of the bullet. A strike, head on, to 30 degrees, above or below, or at either side, will result in a penetration. What we want to avoid, however, is the glancing blow, like this, where the bullet will bounce off and clear. Now, a bullet, glancing in that way may result in penetrating a little way, but it will be held up by the thickness of the metal. I think that's all I can tell you, sir. Thank you very much, Sergeant Major. With the anti-tank rifle, as with all other weapons, we shoot to kill. And once again, common sense plays its part in deciding the moment when fire should be opened. Everybody in the platoon is trained to use the anti-tank rifle, and any section may be detailed to carry it. Two men in each section should be earmarked for the job. Here then is the anti-tank rifleman with his observer protector controller. In sighting the anti-tank rifle, we must have a good field of fire, if possible of not less than 500 yards. Remember that the blast and flash of the rifle is a thing to be reckoned with. It would soon give the position away, so the muzzle must be well concealed. The anti-tank rifle position is so placed that if and when it fires, the range should be considerably under 300 yards. The OPC has taken up a position from which he can sight and inform his pal of any likely movement by enemy tanks. Hello, what have we here? Or do these old eyes of mine deceive me? Tanks! Okay, I'll fix them. All right, but make sure you do fix them. Tanks are ugly enemies, so for heaven's sake, don't lose your head. Up the road come the tanks at a fair bat. They should be German ones, but we haven't got any over here yet. So we're using light British ones for our purpose. If we handle this carefully, it's in the bag. Let's hope the rifleman doesn't fire too soon. Hey, 
Hey, not yet, not yet. Eat it miles too soon. And the tanks take the hint and leg it away into the tall grass. All he's done is to give his position away while this silly twerp looks this way and that, trying to make out where the target's gone. And wondering what it's all about. A tank with a personal grievance is on its way towards him and out to get him. Crashing through the undergrowth, it carries out a flanking attack on the position and bobs your uncle. That's one tank to the good and one anti-tank rifleman definitely to the bad. Was it the fault of the rifle? No. Our anti-tank rifle is a very good weapon and the best in the world for the job it has got to do. Let us see how this weapon should be handled from the same defensive position with the same field of fire but by a rifleman who knows his job. The cover's the same. There's his OPC on the job. This is his field of view as before. And here comes the enemy up the road towards the position. Tank! Okay! The rifleman springs to action and covers the road, his eyes glued to the sights and keeping a wary eye open for anything that may turn up. The OPC carefully watches the target until it is within the field of view of his rifleman. Here the rifleman picks it up and with his sights aligned on the leading tank, he waits for his prey to enter the trap. Here are three reasons why you should wait for it. Nice going, rifleman. You've certainly scared off the rest of that bunch, and as for the results on hand, one tank, very dead. Two anti-tank riflemen, very much alive, with the wisdom of knowing when to fire. The Thompson submachine gun, Tommy gun to you and me, is a most deadly weapon when you know how to use it. It's a short-range weapon and very effective up to 50 yards when skillfully handled. It can be fired from the waist, by a sense of direction, or from the shoulder using the sights. And with its terrific rate of fire, its effect on morale is very great indeed. But when to fire it, that's the point we all want to know. Here then is the situation. The corporal, who is the patrol leader, has spotted the enemy. He has seen something coming up the road directly to his front, and with good cover both to left and right. Signaling to his section to go to ground, he himself takes up a fire position. Oh, much too soon. The Germans dash for cover well out of effective range. Looks as if this frightful looking blighter had a personal grievance to air with that corporal. And that's that. 200 yards away they were, but the Germans knew when to fire, and so, unhindered, continued to advance. Bad. Very bad. Very bad indeed. In fact, bloody awful. Our corporal didn't know the first rules of the game. He opened fire too soon and gave the enemy the initiative. Now, here's the same situation, but with a slightly different slice of country. A friendly patrol is out, and from the undergrowth in the background emerges one of them, the left flank man moving carefully from cover to cover and keeping a wary eye open for the enemy. Next comes the corporal, covering him by the fire of his tommy gun and also moving cautiously forward, while the remainder of the patrol brings up his rear. All are ready for instant action from whatever quarter the threat may come. The left flank man moves forward to the cover of a bush when suddenly he freezes. Enemy scouts have been seen advancing up the road towards them. Bye. With a warning word, he drops into cover while the corporal leaps forward to gain the gorse bush to his front from which he can follow every movement of the enemy. On come the scouts down the road, but the corporal's not going to be satisfied with such small change. 
seeing that the enemy is about to signal on the main body of his formation, he gets all set for the great event. No enemy in sight, if you only knew. So on they come, a full section of them, into the jaws of death. Their scouts make off on their next bound. That's right, Corporal, to hell with them. We want the section. Let them go, we'll attend to them after we put those other fellows on the spot. Any moment now. Oh, nice shooting. Now, single fire from the shoulder. One, two, three, four, and five. Well done, Corporal, that's what we wanted. The signal to advance, and on we go. That fellow knew when to fire. He shot to kill, and then some. Aircraft. Aircraft, when within effective range, should be engaged by all available fire. Rifles and light automatics are the answer to the dive bomber and ground strafer, and very effective they are. Low flying planes, by reason of their speed and unsteady flight, have much less chance of hitting you than you have of blasting them from the sky. The rifle can quickly be brought from the slung position into aim and fired. Ten rounds from a fully charged magazine can do immense damage to that hostile hedge hopper. And for this reason, all sights when on the march are set at 500 yards against the enemy from the sky. So with the Bren gun, spitting destruction from the hip and from the shoulder, sending that jetty plane crashing down to earth. Somewhere in England, a platoon is on the line of march, in AA formation, making every use of cover, and with a gas and air sentry marching on ahead, keeping a weather eye on the sky for hostile aircraft, and with an ear for the sound of droning engines. All magazines are fully charged, and all sights set at 500 yards. The stage is set, and up goes the curtain on Act One. Aircraft action! Aircraft action, and the platoon springs to it, deploying into cover on either side of the road. Aircraft front! Section leaders order aircraft front. So far, so good. Very far! There we go again. Opening up on those planes must be a good 4,000 feet. Do they look close enough to you? Well, by what these planes see from up there, they're mighty high. They can only spot you at that height because you've given your position away. You've asked for it and you've got it. Lucky you aren't bombed up as well. But while all this has been going on, a jetty plane in another sector of the sky has come crashing down to earth. done that? One section of riflemen done that. A dive bomber had the temerity to attack them, but they were stalwart chaps who knew their stuff. They knew when to fire. And this is how they did it. There they go, under cover at the side of the road, but Jerry's suspicious and dies to attack. Front. A warning order, aircraft front. Just that, and no more. And the plane, though as yet well out of range, comes diving at them at 400 miles an hour. It's pulling out. And that's how it's done. The sentry comes out of cover and gives the attack over, and so, having charged their magazines and confident and ready for any other Messerschmitt, Dornier, Junkers, or what have you, on they go once more. They had the tools, they finished the job. They knew when to fire. They shot to kill. The Bren gun, in its role of protective cover for transport columns under cover, is ideally suited for the job. But are the Bren gunners? Aircraft action! So far, so good. Alive and ready for action. 
Once again, off they go, firing at a mere speck in the sky. He hasn't a hope in hell of hitting it, but that pilot's watching the ground like a hawk. But just such a welcome signpost as this fellow's putting up. Has he seen anything? Who knows? And planes have radios to whistle up bombers on just such a target. And here they are, sooner than usual. I'm glad I'm not a transport driver in that particular wood. because that damn fool Bren Gunner lost his head. And now let's do it right. The Bren Gun crews are in position, ready and alert. Aircraft, action! The alarm is given. Aircraft, front! Over the top flies Jerry, searching, searching, but he's seen nothing to indicate the presence of troops or transport. And all goes on as usual within the confines of the wood. Time marches on, then suddenly out of the blue. Where did those blighters come from? We didn't give them anything, did we? Or did we? Aircraft, action! Those damn tracks must have done it. And now we've got dive bombers out for blood. Hold it. The lower they dive, the easier they get. Aircraft, front! Got him, Bren Gunner. Good work. That was shooting for a kill. And so once more, life gets back to normal. And regimental transport remains in one piece, which I think you'll agree is thanks to the Bren Gunners holding their fire. Here's a stretch of country over which a platoon is to attack an enemy locality. Now, so far we've dealt with the use of weapons in a defensive manner. But holding fire and knowing when to fire is just as important in the attack and may make all the difference between success and disaster. Over to the diagram for a moment. There's the Hun position on the left. Opposite them, the British covering fire position and above, the assault section's position. From the assault sections to the Huns, there's a series of gaps in the cover available. Not an easy job, this. But the covering fire section should be able to give invaluable help by keeping the enemy's heads down while the gaps are crossed. So let's take a look now at the ground and see what's involved. From the first cover, the assault sections have to advance across a gap to this bush. Then follows another gap, which affords a little cover, but not much, until finally cover is reached again. then on across a very wide open space to the enemy position. Our covering fire section is beautifully sighted for the job with an uninterrupted view over the sights to the Hun helmets and their hastily dug weapon pits. And covering fire is what our lads are continuously giving. But it's not covering anything. The assault sections, when under cover, are being supported by withering fire, which, if it lasts out over the next gap, will certainly pack up through sheer lack of ammo long before the final assault. They're under cover now. Why waste ammunition in keeping Jerry's head down? He can't see anything. And now for the vital last leg of the attack. Where's that covering fire we've heard so much from? Just as we thought. No ammunition to see the real job through when we get to it. That last lap is entirely open, and without our bullets thumping into Jerry's parapet to keep him from noticing things, the assault hasn't much hope of survival. And all because they fire too soon. The assault party prepares for that last leg. Their officer comes forward to give the signal for covering fire to commence. Little do they know that they'll have to face what's in store without it. Firing has stopped altogether now, as the Bosch, with heads on high and taking in the countryside at large, spot our lads bearing down on them. 
Money for jam. And all the while, not a shot to help them out. Why? Well, you know the answer. Fire was not controlled to do the job in hand. Don't let that happen to you, or one day you'll be doing the assaulting. See how the job is handled by men who know their onions. The covering fire section is on the aim and well hidden in the excellent cover of the position. Not a shot is fired, but they're ready and confident that they can support the assault sections to the last dash across that final gap. The section commander, you seem to know that face, has an eye on that enemy locality which is the objective for the assault sections as before. The gaps in the cover on the line of attack are empty, no need for fire. Jerry is on the alert too, sighting the gap. But here comes that covering fire. Down go their heads and fire is so accurate that he don't snatch even a glimpse of what's going on. Gap number two. Off we go again. Down go their heads again until the final cover is reached. And still nobody's told Jerry the facts of life. Nothing to be seen, eh? Huh. Just you wait. Here comes the signal to the covering fire party. The section commander sees it, and all unknown to the enemy, muscles are tensed and fingers tighten round triggers. It seems a long stretch, that last gap, but with good covering fire and support, we'll manage it all right. On your marks, get set. Rapid fire! Down go their heads. And on come our lads in a last dash across the open to the enemy. Our assault sections charge in, carry the immediate enemy weapon pits at the point of the bayonet. Stop! And so on to the remainder. And once again, our old friend grins his sardonic grin. It is sardonic, isn't it, Corporal? the scope of the platoon is the anti-tank two-pounder gun, but still the rules of holding fire apply. Normally, fire should not be opened with this weapon over 600 yards, and the best effect will be obtained even nearer at 400 yards. A warning has been given to all troops with anti-tank weapons that enemy AFVs are in the vicinity. Yet look at this exhibition of stupidity. One lookout instead of two and no attempt at cover from ground or air observation. You certainly make a good target standing out there like that, like a signpost for all the world to see. Something on your mind? Ha! Huh. Here come a couple of tanks in the middle distance. Light British ones again for our purpose, though of course all German tanks are vulnerable to fire from the two-pounder anti-tank gun. Hey, three of them now. For God's sake, handle this properly. Now, come on, get sorted out. Don't waste valuable time. And just who is going to lay that gun? Oh, that's better. We're getting a little order out of chaos, but this doesn't look a very healthy sign, though. Those tanks are a mighty long way off. Turn quick left! On! 1,200! Red a half! Fire! No, oh, my hat. Any effect on the tanks? None at all, except to hand them the information on a plate that our two-pounder is in this particular spot. Down they go into the ravine. But where are they going to come out again? Get down, man. Get your crew down and keep your fingers crossed. You've got yourself into a nice hot spot, and a tank with a bone to pick is on to your little party. And the right way. Can you see the anti-tank two-pounder? It's here somewhere with its barrel pointing straight at you. This is concealment at its best, and will make a nice little surprise packet for the Bosch. Hello, here's one of the lookouts on the job. And here's the gun, well under cover, very good indeed. Nearby, the crew are also well concealed and ready for action. He seems to have spotted something. What is it? Tanks? Yes. Tanks coming down the valley, 1,200 yards away. 
Sergeant, tank. The crew springs into action, each man knowing his job and getting there quick. On. 400. Left a half, left a half. Wait for it now, wait for it. Kick them in the stomach as they come over that rise. Good shot, sir. Rex target. 400. Zero. Zero. Fire. And again, a grand shooting. Come on, kick him in the pants there. Rex target. Low left. On. 400. Great shooting, Sergeant. There goes another one. What's your total now? Nine, sir. Nine, eh? What a gun crew. Shoots a treat, I reckon. Shoots a treat. Our film is drawing to its close, and short now is our time. Let's quickly recapitulate the lessons learnt in rhyme. A kind of trailer film you'll see, brief shots from many scenes. The commentary in rhyme will stress Hold fire and all it means. When in defense, withhold your fire until the Hun draws near. Do not let fly at scouts far off, for it may cost you dear. Anticipate the Hun's next move. Select your spot and wait. Then, when he's in your field of fire, turn on the rapid rate. Now, in attack, the same idea of holding fire will pay. Here we give covering fire to help our sections on their way. And where they move along unseen, they'll do so undismayed. It's in the open and assault that they will need your aid. When on patrol with Tommy gun, let Huns get well in range. 200 yards is too far off. They've time to make a change. Wait till they're 50 yards or less. Then from the waist, let drive. And as they scatter, Single shots, one, two, three, four, and five. To fire an aircraft out of range is madness, as you'll see. It gives away the hiding place, concealment, all new peace. The Messerschmitt will radio glad tidings to its base, and then the Heinkels will appear and bomb your hiding place. A roadblock is an obstacle to any German tanks, especially if on a bend surrounded by high banks, and then if men with rifle boys are covering the block, they will deliver to those tanks a very nasty shock. The German tank is easy meat in open country too. See what the old two-pounder at 400 yards can do. It waits until it cannot fail. And then, well, look at this. It hits one in the stomach at a range it cannot miss. Well, there you are. We've done our best to show you what to do. And now the time has come for me to bid you all adieu. So now I wish you all good luck wherever you may go. Remember, hold your fire and shoot to kill the so-and-so.